This is a Parasol Macro Lepiota Procera, and this is a really good edible mushroom. So they're fairly common in grasslands and meadows in around late summer and early autumn. You can find them growing individually, but they're more common found in troops or in rings, like this ring here. And just in this one field alone, there's a good four or five of the rings. The cap of the mushroom starts off spherical when it's younger, like this, and then they flatten out as they age, and they can be very large, usually around 25 centimetres across. These are quite small ones. It's got a dark brown umbo, or bump, in the centre of the cap, which is leathery to the touch and you'll see these scales around the mushroom and that is this umbo which cracks as the mushroom expands. The gills are white when they're younger or more mature mushrooms they go a slightly light brown to off-white colour. The gills are crowded and they're free of the stipe, meaning there's a gap between the gills and the stipe, or the stem. The stipe, or the stem, is very fibrous. It's pretty much inedible because it's just too tough to eat, but you can still use them in stocks. The stipe is a very important identification feature for this mushroom because it has a snakeskin-like pattern on it, which is a really good indicator of this mushroom, which separates it from some of the other look-alike parasol mushrooms. You see that cracked snakeskin-like effect there? Another important feature on the stem, you can see it's got a white double ring on the stem here. And this ring, if you're careful, is movable, so you can slide it up and down the stem. So this ring is where the cap used to attach to the stem when it was immature. And you can see this one's just broken away from it. The main mushroom that you'll confuse the parasol with is the shaggy parasol, which is classed as edible in some books and edible with caution in other books, and it can give a gastric upset to some people. So if you do want to try the shaggy parasol, then it's best just to try a small amount of it first. The main difference being is the true parasol has the snake skin pattern on the stem whereas the shaggy parasol doesn't and also the shaggy parasol has a shaggier cap than this. The scales will stick out a lot more. You also want to take care of the dapplings, some of which are very poisonous. They'll never grow anywhere near as big as this. But as long as you follow the identification features I gave you and they're at least this big then you'll be fine. You'll know it's a true parasol. So the parasol is a really good edible mushroom. It's one of my favourites. And what I do is I take the cap off of the stipe. And my favourite way to cook it is to pan it in breadcrumbs and then fry it like a schnitzel. They're also really good just sliced up and fried with garlic, salt and thyme, just like you would normal shop-bought mushrooms. I'm out on a camping trip in the Wye Valley at the moment, 
So I'm going to be having parasols for my dinner tonight. So here's one I'm always very happy to find. This is my number one favorite edible mushroom. It's known by quite a few names, the Sep, the Porcini. In Britain, we know it as the Penny Bun. And I think in America, it's known as the King Belit. I think most mushroom foragers would agree with me. This is one of the best edible mushrooms out there. I think the British name Penny Bun is quite a good name for it because it does look quite like a bread roll on the cap and it even sometimes has little holes in the cap that looks like little bits of the crust missing. The seps usually appear in one big glut then appear in smaller groups throughout the autumn. The glut usually starts in early September up in Scotland and then it works its way down the UK as the temperature drops. It can change year on year depending on the temperature and amount of rainfall. I find in the south it's best for seps around late September. Seps can be found in most types of woodland but I find them most often in amongst beech and oak woodland. You can see here this is mostly beech woodland here and I also find that these mushrooms are more prolific around the edges of woodland. So you can see there, this is the edge of the woodland. And the first sort of 10 to 15 meters into the woodland, you're more likely to find seps there. They do grow deeper in the woodland, but I find they're more prolific here. And also they can spill out onto the grass surrounding the woodland. And they're the ones that are easier to spot. Seps are a mycorrhizal fungi, so they have a symbiotic relationship with the trees. It's a mutually beneficial arrangement where the fungi will send its mycelial strands into the roots of the trees and they will share nutrients and water. So how to identify them? Here's a good example of a very young one next to a medium sized one there. The caps can grow up to around 30 centimetres and they're a light to dark brown on top. When they're really young, they're quite pale like this. So they're convex and then the cap starts to flatten with age. Here's a older one that's been quite eaten here. You see how that's flattened out and even starts to roll up at the edges. And another important identification feature is that on the cap it is lighter at the margin. So you see it's got like a, a white line running around the edge of the cap. The stems are quite thick and they're usually wider at the base than they are at the top. So they taper towards the cap and they have reticulations on the stem. So you see this web-like pattern on the stem. So it's a raised pattern of white lines on a slightly darker background. So underneath the cap, as with all the beliefs, instead of gills, it's got pores. And on a younger specimen like this, those pores are white. As the mushroom matures, it will go yellow and then like an olive green when it's really mature. So once they've reached this sort of stage, they're not really good for eating fresh anymore, but they can still be dried. Although this one looks a bit too eaten by other wildlife for me. So if you cut it in half, the flesh should be nice and white, like that, and nice and firm. If it instantly turns blue, then it's possible that you've got a poisonous bleat. 
and the flesh should have a nice pleasant mushroomy smell it doesn't really have a strong odor if you're eating them fresh then from about this size to this size is perfect I like them just sliced up and pan fried with maybe some butter and thyme and garlic when they start to get a bit more mature say so maybe from this size and a bit bigger I'll take the cap off cut the stem into rings and slice up the cap and then dry them with the dried mushrooms it really intensifies the flavor and they're great to use as a stock or you can use them in soups and broths or you can use them in risotto and it gives pretty much anything an amazing flavor Earlier in the year we looked at eating beech leaves, now in the autumn we can harvest the beech nuts. So beech nuts are a bit smaller than the other nuts that we can harvest in the UK. So you have to collect a decent amount to be able to use them, but they are very high in good fats and proteins. The nuts ripen from around mid-September to early October and they grow in these quite distinctive looking husks that are covered in spikes. They start off quite a bright green when they're immature and then the husks go brown as the nuts inside start to ripen. To tell that the nuts inside are ripe the husks, as I said, should be dark brown. These ones are still a bit light and also they should come away from the stem quite easily. If you pull on them and they don't come away, then they're not ripe. And also the husks split open and separate into four segments like this here. And then you can see the nuts inside but once they've opened, you need to be quite quick because they do fall out quite easily or the uh, squirrels will come and get them. Inside each of the husks, you'll get two of the beech nuts and each of the nuts has three edges. And the nut is surrounded by a brown shell that you need to take off. You may notice some years that the trees produce husks that are empty or just have shells with no flesh inside. And other years, like this year in my area, the trees produce many more casings with decent sized nuts. So this is a masting year when you get an abundance of nuts and you can see this tree is absolutely loaded with them. And it's thought the reason trees do this is that trees in a local group will communicate with each other and have several lean years of producing less nuts or fruits. So the creatures that feed on them will have less food and their numbers will drop over a few years. Then once every four or five or maybe more years, they will have a masting year like this with lots of nuts and there will be less creatures to eat them. So more of the nuts will have a chance of growing into trees.
Beech nuts are good, lightly toasted and used in similar ways to pine nuts. I like to toss them for a salad or add it into a risotto. The beech nuts shouldn't be eaten in really large quantities as they become mildly toxic if you eat too many, but you would have to eat quite a serious amount for them to become toxic. But I generally just eat a few handfuls like this a week during the autumn. I've never felt any ill effect from them. And it's best not to eat many of them raw. It's right to just nibble on a few to try them, but again, they become toxic if you eat too many of them raw. That's what the beech nuts look like when you take them out of their shell. So some years they're just not worth bothering with because they're too small. But this year, in my area at least, is a very good year for them. This is a giant polypore, or blackening polypore. Last month I filmed one at its younger stage and I said I'd try to include a more mature one in a future video. So here you can see they do grow quite large. It's surrounding most of this beech stump. It will mostly be too tough to eat at this stage, but the edges are still good to eat as long as they're still quite nice and soft. These are wild hops, Humulus lupulus, and in September we can harvest these, the female flower cones. They're fairly common and they're a climbing plant and I often see them climbing through the brambles and blackthorn bushes along country roads like this. So it grows along these vines and its leaves grow in an opposite arrangement and the leaves either have three or five lobes, usually three. And the margins are toothed. And the leaves have a very rough texture. So these are the female flower cones and these are the ones that we want to use. To tell that they're ripe, they should be a light green to yellowish colour and they should have a browning at the tip like that. Also they should feel nice and dry and papery and make that nice crunchy sound when you squash them. And they should have a nice citrusy smell to them. Also when you open them up, you should see the dark yellow lupulin glands, which is where the resin is. So these ones here are still a little bit underripe. You can see that they're a bright green all over and there's no browning at the tips. And also if you pick one and you squeeze it between your fingers, it kind of just mushes up because it's still quite damp. So those aren't quite ready yet. And these ones are probably a bit over. You see they're not just brown at the tip anymore. They're pretty much brown all over. And they've got a smell that's a bit garlicky. So they'll be a bit too bitter. Hops have a nice citrusy flavor and they're quite bitter. They're traditionally used for flavoring ale and they have a soporific and calming effect and are good made into a tea to help with sleep. And in fact, just the smell of them can help you sleep. So you can dry them and put them into like a small open weave bag and have them next to your bed. And that's a good natural sleep aid.